Hello and welcome. I want to welcome uh, our folks who are here in our room, uh, in our circle here in Kingston. I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee nations. I also want to acknowledge the um, the claim of the, the Huron-Wendat to these lands, a the traditional claim as well. Um, I'm really happy to be hosting Mia Amir and Lisa Ravensbergen here, as well as this cohort of amazing artists from uh, all over. And I'm going to leave Mia to do most of the, inv the introductions, but I just want to acknowledge or say that this room, all of our chairs are on wheels, except for yours, Cynthia, but that's okay. You can move if you want. Um, people may be coming and going into this space, and so, you know, adjust, we'll adjust the room to uh, open up the circle to include them, and also we can tighten up if folks have to go, and, and coming and going is okay. Yeah. So, Mia, I'm going to pass the mic over to you, and thank you. Just rearranging the technology. Great. Oh, oh. Ha, ha, ha. We have the technology of a table. On wheels. <laughs> wheels. <laughs> here, here. Beautiful. Um, I am really feeling called to uh, just vaguely reorganize our plan. I'm so sorry, but I just want us to say who we are and where we're com coming from today. Uh, oh, I can look here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I just really want to introduce our entire cohort before we get started. Um, we'll do our proper other check-in next, but if we could just say our names and, and where we're calling from, that would be great. Yeah. Oh, so my name's Mia Susan Amir. And um, I'm calling here from the Fulda Festival. I'm Lisa Cook Ravensburg, and I'm doing the same. This is Rue George Warren, calling in from the mountains of North Carolina stateside, where I'm currently in a grocery store parking lot, which is the only place I could get reception. So I'm sorry I can't be there uh, and see you all, but excited for this. Hello. Hi, I'm Debbie Patterson, and I'm calling in from uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Dene, the Cree, the Oja Cree, and the Dakota peoples. And it is also the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, hi, my name is Jessica Schacht. I'm calling in from the traditional territory of the Cowichan Nation. Uh, uh, also known as Duncan uh, on Vancouver Island, BC. Uh, this is Grant. Uh, I'm calling uh, Grant Miller. I use they, them pronouns. I'm calling from the traditional territory of the Multnomah, Clackamas, Kalapuya, um, Clackamas, and um, many other unnamed bands. There, there are a lot of tribes around here, uh, which is also um, the territory of the uh, Grand Ronde. The Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde are also in this area. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Lindsay, um, and I'm calling in from so-called Edmonton, which is actually really, um, yeah, intensely beautiful gathering place of uh, a lot of First Nations, um, Blackfoot, Cree, Papa Chase, Dene, Iroquois, Inuit, Nakota Sioux, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, and Métis Nations as well. And so we are some of the members of the Unsettling Dramaturgy Colloquium. And uh, Rue and I are co-coordinators of this project, and we're thrilled for this to be the public launch of our work. Um, we've been working quietly over the last six months. Uh, 
developing relationships and starting to understand the shape of what we want to make together and our collective shape. Um, and I'm really thrilled that Lisa is able to join us uh, as somebody who's adjacent to this project. And, um, and I'm really excited for our conversation today. So Rue and I wanted to tell you all a little bit about unsettling dramaturgy before we launch into the conversation. I'm wondering if you'd like to start us off. Rue? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so unsettling dramaturgy is an ongoing project bringing together Crip and Indigenous dramaturgs from across so-called Canada and the United States, um, working in lots of different areas, including theater, dance, and experimental performance. We're using digital platforms uh, where we gather to build relationships, to explore and document the critical convergences and divergences in our experiences and work, uh, to amplify Crip and Indigenous aesthetics, ethics, practices, and leadership, in our local, national, and international performance ecologies. We want to push the conversations from inclusion to centering, from reconciliation to unsettling and decolonization. So the project proposes a continuation of the thriving legacies of leadership and innovation that shape Indigenous and Crip dramaturgies, but in a whole new way by bringing together artists from communities that have been historically uh, excluded from mainstream uh, performance e ecologies and uh, which have been further siloed into spaces of making that have systematically prevented critical cross-community collaboration. We're dismantling these silos to advance emerging conversations exploring the conflux of leadership and representation in creation and production as relates to Indigenous sovereignty and deaf, mad, and disability culture in the arts. We're generating a platform for self-determined encounter and exchange where our local bodies of knowledge can be activated. Tag. My turn? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it bears importance to share that this project does not aim to collapse Crip and Indigenous dramaturgies and experiences. The exclusions that our communities face emerge from very specific historical, cultural, and political contexts. Further, the ableism, sanism, and autism that deaf, disabled, and mad artists face emerge from colonial ways of assigning value and human dignity. We use CRIP to, in we use the language of CRIP to include those who identify as mad, sick, and disabled, as well as those who are deemed disabled by society and or medical institutions, whether or not they themselves accept the term. For example, those for whom deafness is a cultural identity, not a medical condition. We use the word CRIP as a political intervention to turn attention onto and to disrupt, as our collaborator Carmen Papalia, who's not here today, writes, the disabling conditions that limit a person and or community's agency and potential to thrive. And we use the term indigenous with an acknowledgement of the many complex ways the community, family, belonging, polity, and heritage interact with systems of state recognition. The words Crip and Indigenous are both used as shorthand, really, uh, and are not intended to generalize or reduce the vast multiplicity of our identities, experiences, and affiliations. So that's a bit about our project or the kind of like urge that lives underneath it. Um, we wanted to give you a little outline so you know what's going to happen next. Um, so we're, we've got like two hours together. And the invitation is for you to bear witness to a conversation that is about to take place between the one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 some of us. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> before that, we're going to do some introductions of ourselves and our practice. We're going to invite you to have an opportunity to introduce yourself to one other person in the room. Um, then we're going to converse, and then there we're, we're going to do a praxis session where you all will exchange with each other with some parameters, and then um, you'll have a collective exchange which we will witness, and then we'll close. Does that make sense? Any questions? Right on. Yeah, totally. Um, 
So through this format, we're letting you in on a conversation that we are having with and for each other, <laughs> with and for Crip and Indigenous dramaturgs. We invite you to participate in the first part of this event, as I said, as witnesses, and with that understanding. Um, and this is our radical act of centering our practices, voices, and experiences to undermine the ways in which we are often asked to perform these conversations to educate others. Um, we're countering the extractive nature that we often confront in our work. So we encourage you to take notes in the Slack channel that Adrian had set up. Um, and uh, this will assist the latter parts of our event. And this is a place for you all to just like document reflections, impressions, sensations, words, uh, anything that's coming up for you as you are witnessing the conversation. Yeah? Cool? Okay, right on. So we are going to introduce ourselves now, panelists. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves by sharing our names, pronouns, a visual description. We skipped something really important. I'm just going to finish what I'm saying. OK. A visual description, who we've already shared, where we're calling in from, any access needs that we have, and a little bit about our practice. And we're each going to do that in two minutes or less. Yeah? Right on. Who would like to go first? I can start. Uh, so again, this is Rue calling in from a parking lot on Cherokee land in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, I use he, him, or they, them. Um, and I am about six foot one, white skinned Catawba person. That's where I'm located most of my time is on the Catawba reservation in South Carolina. Um, I've got short curly hair, blue eyes, and a beard, and I usually have a pretty big smile on my face. Um, I already told you where I'm from, and uh, from I'm from reservation land, but currently on uh, Cherokee land. In terms of access needs, my access needs for today is that when people are speaking, if they can uh, identify themselves verbally so that I know who's speaking. And then for uh, Mia in the room, if there's things happening in the room, if, if that can just be narrated or conveyed verbally, um, just so that I know what's, what's going on in there, I'd really appreciate it. And then as far as my practice, um, my background is in operatic performance, but I've moved pretty rapidly into the, the area of theater and experimental performance. Uh, a lot of my practice is also community-based working back in my tribal community on language revitalization and food sovereignty um, and seeing how performance and dramaturgy um, can come into, into this world um, that we've been inhabiting for, for millennia. So, uh, Hobo, thank you so much, and I'm excited for this conversation. Debbie, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Debbie Patterson. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm, uh, I have, I, I have uh, shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing dollar store reading glasses and uh, a white sweater. I'm sitting in my, my super awesome purple tie light wheelchair at the moment. Um, and uh, my practice is uh, primarily theater, um, and I just I'm I'm just going to share an experience from yesterday. I was invited to give the keynote address at the mayor's luncheon for the arts in Winnipeg. So there were like a couple of hundred people there, business leaders, the mayor, all the members of city council, and then all the all the artists or representatives from all the arts organizations in Winnipeg. And I talked at, at um, I talked about uh, disability justice, reconciliation, and climate change as being the primary things I'm working on right now, and and uh, and challenged challenged the primacy of, of capitalism in our in our world and how how uh, I, I I called for the end of capitalism basically in this speech and was shocked at how many 
how many people came up to me afterwards and said, you said everything I've been thinking about lately, which was uh, amazing to me. And not just the artists telling me this, this was business leaders, this was politicians telling me that they all share this, this vision that we need to disrupt capitalism and, and start using the, uh, the tools that artists use to measure our success as, as the, uh, the yardstick for, for what has value in our world. So that was super, super hopeful, and I just wanted to share that. Bonjour, Rani. Gamino Bimata Zidakwe Nadishnikaz. My name is Lisa uh, Cook Ravensbergen. My, my, uh, the other name I've been given is uh, She Who Walks uh, in a Good Way. Um, and uh, yeah, no pressure there. And um, I'm uh, sitting beside Mia in a skirt and white blouse with mustardy yellow dots. I have very long hair that goes down my back, black, um, with a few white hairs. <laughs> oh my good lord, it's begun. Um, I have brown eyes, I have my glasses that, go on, that are on my head sometimes and on my face other times. Um, I have a moon face. Um, yeah, um, I'm, s uh, I'm sitting in the room with everyone here at the theater. Uh, I'm a theater artist and a, and a mama. Um, I'm here doing a show for Fulda and unfortunately I will need to leave uh, early um, because I have a show to do with my boy, Nodin, who's here with me, um, called Citation. Um, my needs are, I don't think I have very many needs except to be able to give space, I think, just uh, to not, um, to give, allow for space between people talking for me so that I'm not, I don't get, I don't want to miss what somebody's trying to say. And we're not in the same space, so we can't take visual cues from each other. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, the work that I tend to do um, these days, because I'm a grad student here at Queen's, I'm in cultural studies. Um, Dylan tells me, my supervisor, that I'm the only indigenous theater artist in the country that is, has this degree when I'm done. Uh, which is alarming to me. I don't feel like that's something that I'm f that we're proud of, or that Queens is should be proud of. I feel like it's kind of embarrassing uh, for Queens. Um, but I'm honored to be in this position, and I'm honored to share uh, the work here as a theater artist and an Indigenous <coughs> theater artist um, with my fellow theater artists um, Sarah Garten Stanley and Libs Fry. Um, and I'm theoretically defending a thesis at the end of the summer. So if all goes well, that will happen. So the work that I tend to do these days is mostly, I think, around um, acknowledging occupation, I feel like, um, and also um, trying to distill everything down. I feel like it's around um, the work the performative work of ceremony and the transformative uh, power of the of a relational praxis um, that to me is embedded in the cultural teachings that I've been raised with but also as an uh, my mom is English and Irish and I'm Anishinaabe and Cree I'm Oji Cree and so so I've I'm a bridge that has been walking and leaving a trail of bridge behind me so so I feel like um, I'm living on the bridge and trying to understand what the currents are doing and responding to that in relationship to who happens to be with me on the bridge um, and beside me. So, so yeah, I tend to work interdisciplinarily and I'm also, I'm just an actor as well um, and a director and I do a lot of things. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of it. Did I miss anything? Grant, would you go next? Um, 
my name again is Grant Miller. Um, they, them pronouns. I am, uh, I have uh, black hair with a little bit of gray threads woven in. Um, I'm white, wearing big, chunky headphones on my ears with a, a sort of grid pattern on a button up and a, a gray undershirt. Um, I'm about five foot one, uh, sitting against a white background with a painting behind me. Um, I have hands that drape like willow trees. And um, yeah, I think that's my description. Um, so again, I'm from uh, the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Clackamas, uh, Kathlamet, Chinook, Kalapuya people, as well as other unnamed bands. Um, I uh, access needs. Oh, which is um, a colonized name, Portland, Oregon, in the US. Um, my access needs include, uh, I might turn off my camera uh, every once in a while just to take care of an access need. Um, but I'm still engaged with the conversation. Um, my allergies are acting up, so I'm a little cloudy in the head. I might ask folks to repeat themselves. Um, and uh, I don't know that this access need can really, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what can be done about this, but for me, there's a little bit of a mystery in looking at a room of people who are across the space from this camera. And so just kind of wondering who's here um, just impacts my access in a way that I'm, I'm still kind of working with and sitting with here. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and like I see that there's like shifting around happening because I'm guessing new people are coming into the room or something like that. Um, and someone's waving their arms. And so like these sort of, of cues and signals, are, I think are also kind of useful um, I, uh, for the people who are present there, just because there's, um, uh, there's a relationality that I'm still trying to like get a sense of. Um, and praxis is the next thing on the list of self-introduction. Um, art praxis, um, art and social justice praxis. Um, so um, my work is uh, primarily performance-based. Uh, I self-identify as an artist, uh, queer, non-binary, disabled. And um, my uh, primary work right now is with a project called Grotto Worlds, uh, which I just got a grant for, yay, um, which is a collaborative effort with uh, myself, my partner, and then two other collaborators. Um, and for this project, we're incorporating uh, components of virtual reality, uh, uh, incorporating uh, like aspects of trauma, nervous system regulation in having conversations about social justice um, and equity. Uh, and we're also um, uh, like, we're, we're, we're trying to create sort of performance spaces or performance opportunities in which audience members um, are invited to share and participate in a sense, but also um, do so in a way that it disassembles a lot of what's kind of assumed or standard in most theater. Um, and so I think some people might look at what we're doing and question, well, like, is that exactly theater? Um, which is, is part of the hope, because I think there's a lot in theater that, that uh, wants to be uh, rethought, reimagined, reinvented, uh, particularly from a, a disability standpoint. Um, and other praxis just include reorienting to my body in any given moment and then trying to be in dialogue with other people about where our bodies are um, and how we're relating to the space in a given moment. Um, I feel like we're, there's, a, there's a lot of being taught that um, what's happening within our bodies is in conflict with our surroundings uh, because our surroundings expect our bodies to be all the same. And so I, th I think a big part of my praxis is just trying to disrupt that uh, in, in most given moments. <laughs> um, check. Jessica, would you introduce yourself? 
Sure. Tom Jay, my name is Jessica Schacht. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I uh, have dark brown hair, which is uh, swept up away from my face, dark brown eyes, tan skin, and I'm wearing a bright blue dress uh, and a pair of cedar bark earrings uh, with a pair of turquoise black and white moccasins on them. Uh, I am in my TV room slash guest room at home, uh, which has got uh, blue walls. There are some yellow blankets and a painting in the corner. And I'm in a north facing room. So part of my face is in shadow despite my best efforts to arrange the lighting. <laughs> um, I am, a, uh, what's this? Uh, yes, I'm a Métis uh, mixed Canadian settler ancestry, uh, born on the lands of the Lekwungen speaking people, now known as the Esquimalt and Songhees Nations, uh, also known as Victoria, BC, and now live on, uh, as an uninvited guest on the traditional territory of the Cowichan Nation, part of the Hokum Treaty Group, which is in stage four uh, principal negotiations, um, also known as Duncan BC. Um, uh, in terms of access needs, I might need to get up and go, but prob uh, just leave briefly, but I'll try to do that at appropriate times, such as when the audience is interacting uh, in their own engagements. Um, and in terms of my uh, praxis, um, uh, my focus is on dramaturgy, writing, and directing. And my work uh, centers around exploring identity and relationships through uh, cultural, environmental, and personal experiences that shape us. Um, I uh, aim to focus on a process over product-based practices um, and focus on holding space and in trying to ensure agency for the people in the room. Um, yeah, thank you. Lindsay, would you introduce yourself? Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Lindsay. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And yeah, as I um, just in terms of a visual description, I'm a white, queer, fat femme with bright red curly hair. And I'm wearing black sparkly cat eye glasses and a green dress and um yeah i'm a treaty six settler um from the gathering space that is now so-called edmonton um in terms of access needs my brain is like really mushy right now and um yeah, I don't even really know what day it is. I made it on time to the Skype call, so that's a win. Um, yeah, I'm in the midst of a lot of grief and loss and um, some slow healing work. Um, so yeah, that means I'm a little bit here and a little bit not here. Um, in terms of what I need, um, I'll probably just need to take breaks at points. Um, I may need to ask after repetition. Um, and I may just lose my thought in the middle of my sentence. So yeah, that's a thing. Um, in terms of praxis, um, I am, uh, I would identify as a mad artist. Um, and mad being a kind of umbrella term for many different complex relationships to um, social and political understandings of mental, quote unquote, mental illness um, and psychiatric systems and institutions. Um, and so my work is mostly in dance and performance. Um, I, for the past 13 years, have been a co-founder and co-director of the Integrated Dance and Disability Art Organization in Edmonton called CRIPSI. Um, yeah, and I, I wouldn't have necessarily identified myself as a dramaturg before. 
Um, although in conversation, I think the kinds of critical questioning practices and reflective practices that I think make good crip art and good mad art um, are, I think, practices that are mobilized in, in dramaturge work. So that's cool. <laughs> um, yeah. And I don't know, I do other stuff, but I can't think of it right now. So, hey. <laughs> Great. And my name is Mia Susan Amir, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, a visual description, I am a light-skinned human with short, dark hair with a lot of gray. I think everybody else is not being as honest. <laughs> um, uh, just joking. Um, I'm wearing a purple Adidas jacket with um, aqua colored th stripes down the arms and black jeans. And under my um, jacket, I'm wearing a black tank top that in white and red reads access is love and um, I'm yeah um, I was born in Israel occupied Palestine I live as an uninvited settler on the unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples colonially known as Vancouver British Columbia I'm a queer, mad Jew of mixed Ashkenazi and Sephardic ascent. Um, that's who I'm from. My access needs are uh, that I have some chronic conditions that sometimes impact my cognition, which might not seem obvious on the outside, but is very palpable on the inside. And sometimes it means my thoughts don't form at a pace that I feel comfortable with. So if I lose my train of thought, I just ask that you allow me to finish my thought at my own pace. Um, I'm also gonna be like bouncing around um, because I think that's how my body processes information and stimulation and sometimes I just need to move. Um, so I'll probably be bouncing uh, a little bit. Um, I um, work as a, in the context of community and cultural practice as a, a creator, a transdisciplinary creator, um, I work as a dramaturg, director, writer, um, cultural organizer, um, advocate in my community, um, and I do a lot of work around disability justice these days um, and the intersections uh, that disability justice offers to other forms of um, other opportunities to interrupt the ways in which power harms us at all levels of our experience. And so um, a lot of my work is oriented towards that. I'm also really tired of talking about disability justice and I'm really um, interested in just being an artist and being able to make work um, and uh, consider all of my work grip mad work uh, because it comes out of the context of my body and my life and my relationships. Um, I don't know what else to say. I'm multiply involved in many different arts making spaces and feel really lucky to have those relationships and I'm in a state of constant emergence in large part because of the ways in which um, the professional arts community is structured uh, meaning that it's very hard for artists with disabilities often to enter into professional practice because of the the expectations around um, how we advance and how we show up and how time <laughs> is measured. Um, I feel like maybe I'm not, am I making sense? Yeah, okay, right on. Um, I have the benefit of being able to ask people here if I'm making sense and they get to nod <laughs> or disagree. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the context of my work. This project came out of a out of my body, mind, out of a deep longing for some critical intersecting conversations that I didn't see happening out of a deep longing for an extended community that, of makers that I didn't have uh, in large part in my community um, where I'm based. Uh, and so I have been really honored to have so many incredible artists from across so-called Canada and so-called United States uh, respond to the call um, with interest in being either directly involved in the core conversations or adjacent to it. And um, and Unsettling Dramaturgy is now um, like a co-created space where we're really trying to create the definition of what we're doing together. Um, yeah.
Yeah. Okay. Right on. So <laughs> um, we had a, a slide card now. Yeah. Um, so all y'all get an opportunity in this room now. Like, let's keep it to three minutes. Each person gets a minute and a half uh, to introduce yourself with your, we'll do the next one, name, your pronouns. Um, you can offer, vi you can practice doing a visual description, um, where, who, and whose land you're from, one thing that brought you to this panel, and an access need that you might have. And maybe if you feel comfortable, introduce yourself to somebody that you haven't had so much of an opportunity to connect with uh, over the course of the last few days. Yeah? So we'll just do this for three minutes. I'll let you know when minute 1.5 is up.
So now uh, we're going to open our discussion with each other. Oh, we can drop the slide if possible. Um, so we had like a hundred really awesome questions that we had uh, listed for us to respond to, um, which we have whittled down. And we won't necessarily directly respond to any of them, but um, because Lisa does need to leave, I wanted to offer um, space to her first to, um, and, and the question that we were thinking about, talking about what was, what does CRIP and or Indigenous dramaturgy mean to you? So in this conversation, we're not trying to define these practices in any kind of static way. We're speaking from our embodied lived experiences of what, what they are. Uh, somebody has joined. Great. Um, so um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa. And then whoever feels so moved to follow, please do. And again, um, those of you who are in the room, feel free to be making notes on Slack if that's useful for you as a way of kind of documenting your memories and your sensations of what is coming up through this conversation. Thank you. Um, again, I'm apologizing because I, I was really looking forward to, to hearing everybody. I'm, there aren't very many indigenous dramaturgs on this land, so I, I don't often get to to share these conversations with, with others. Um, it's a huge question. I don't have any definitive answer. And really all I, I feel like I can offer is a beginning place to, to begin from. So I think for me, part of, uh, part of the practice of Indigenous dramaturgy is we were just talking about that the, 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 the there's a constant um, presencing of uh, of uh, inherent conflict, um, and that being bodies and things like time, and things like space, um, and that the continuum is not a it's not a a linear construct actually, that time is actually a spatial construct, um, and there's uh, we could unpack that that statement alone for a very long time, but. Um, so I feel like for me as a dramaturg and as a maker of work and as a performer and as a mother and as now the knowledge keeper for my family, my father passed recently, that, that, um, that the nuances of, of how we do what we do in relationship to what we, have, what, what we are to ourselves and to each other and how we are with ourselves and to the land in relationship to each other, um, drive my practice in lots of ways because ultimately we're talking about spirit for me um, and so things like we were just talking about even just a construct like this that we're all in together right now that we're in a we're operating inside a praxis that privileges relationship but it's inside a colonial construct of time which is a very hierarchical uh, linear uh, uh, vehicle and it's also constructed in a very specific colonial cons uh, construct which is that there are people with knowledge so there are knowers and there are unknowers which is actually false uh, it's a false construct from my teachings anyway um, and and so so to for me I have this anxiety because I can't honor the, r the relationships that I'm I'm building right now because I have to leave because my child will be waiting for me in 10 minutes and I have to honor that relationship um, and do a show, which is another kind of relationship, you know, to the space and to story and to ceremony. And so, um, so I feel like indigenous dramaturgy is not about uh, assigning value to those, but actually acknowledgement that the, for me, the cultural practice of acknowledgement um, of an acknowledgement of names. So I feel like in lots of ways for me, the dramaturgy is about naming, if I'm gonna super simplify it. And, and being able to name uh, what was, what is, in a way that we're creating prophecy for what will be, that we in this moment are creating prophecy for my child when he has grandchildren. 
we're all doing that. So we all get that opportunity to, to contribute to that story that m my great-grandchildren. So I operate, and I'm also Anishinaabe Kwe, so I have teachings that also demand, me, demand of me to consider seven generations behind me and seven generations ahead. So I am only one generation that carries responsibility and carries acknowledgement of what, I'm only here because of what was done before me, because of who survived. Um, so uh, I'd like to offer um, that for me, again, just as an offering to the room, um, some work questions that I am working with right now. There's five of them. I have, fortunately, I have an image because they were on the Agnes uh, art gallery. They were on the wall at one point. I don't know if they're still there. I haven't even gone to look. Um, so I have an image of them. So I'll put them on Slack. Yes? Okay. Um, and the only other thing I want to add before that, I will. Oh, yeah, I totally will. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add about that was... Um, we were just talking about that, that inside that indigenous methodology and, and um, practice is that I was just saying, like, if this was a room full of indigenous people, we wouldn't want this screen. I just, I mean, I'm sure not to say that we don't like screens. That's not what I'm saying at all. But my, my experience of my colleagues and of my community is that a relationship our bodies, our spirits, our voices are, are what is the centering, the privileging, the, um, yeah, the, the centering of all that we are. We, we cannot be unless we are in relationship. And if you've got people in the room versus a screen and you want us to be in communication and in contact and, and building, we're going to do it just by default. If there's a room, I'm looking at the brown people. That's my default. That's who I'm looking for. I'm talking to to who might be my, my cousins, my relations. So screens are challenging in that way, right? It's a very colonial screens, two dimensionality. Hello, colonialism, right? So it's my friend Adria, she's, she, for instance, she was, um, I love this. She was angry that I wasn't filming my show because it's an audio tour. She said, why can you not cat use the magic of colonialism to capture and conquer time. Why can you not do that? And, and I said, because I cannot. Um, but the, those to me are, are very, I love it. It made me laugh for a long time, still making me laugh. But, but that, that I think for her, she's also, or they are Anishinaabe Kwe, and so for us, that is what's satisfying. You know, being able to look, and this is satisfying, but I can't touch you. I can't smell you. I can't. You know, <laughs> I know, I'm trying. Um, but for me as an indigenous dramaturg, I'm always trying to move us closer to that, whatever that means, and however that might look. So these are five questions. Um, how do our words perform the future? How does memory listen to lineage? Um, how can unlearning become protocol? Where does um, reciprocity reimagine us? And the last question I'm working with these days is how do we acknowledge reclamation? So I'll post these on Slack. Um, I'm sorry I have to go. Maybe I'll see somebody at my show. If you come to the show, Adrian will be there because she's amazing and makes my show possible. The irony is I'm in a digital arts festival. I, I've not even slacked ever before. So I, I know almost nothing <laughs> about the medium that we're working in. But please say hi to me. If you, if you come to the show, please just say hi. I would love that afterwards. And um, I want to say thank you to everyone. I'm sorry that. I have to jet. And thank you, Rue. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Marcy, Lisa, thanks for sharing. Let me know. I want to have, I'll follow along after. Yeah. So
So anyone else want to pick up the question after that? Sure. Um, the, the five questions that were just said at the tail end there, um, I, Lisa, was that, was that her name, their name? Um, how do our words perform the future? How does memory listen to lineage? How can unlearning become protocol? Where does reciprocity reimagine us? And how do we acknowledge reclamation? Um, it brings up uh, so much. Um, and there's just one, one sort of thread that, that I want to pull in at this moment, um, which is that there's a lot of thought in um, disability justice and, and disability circles around dreaming of accessible futures. Um, from uh, Leah Lakshmi, Biepsna uh, Samasara, um, who is a disabled activist located down in the like Oakland Berkeley area. Um, and they talk about how um, like there, there are so many cultural narratives that imagine disabled people no longer existing, whether it be through sort of eugenic ideologies that say we need to do genetic testing so that disabled people no longer exist, or we need to institutionalize disabled people so that we can have a future where they're, they're bred out of existence. And like these, these legacies are familiar to many of us. Um, and what she proposes is dreaming of disability futures, um, dreaming or accessible futures, dreaming of futures where disability is always existing and that it's not, um, it's not sort of this stigmatized feature that belongs to individual bodies, but is a part of um, like a, a collective reality uh, in which biodiversity uh, is important, where um, like that the biodiversity is a, um, is a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The word isn't evidence, the word isn't element, that biodiversity is a factor of healthy ecosystems and that, that having a multiplicity of, of different types of biologies um, is, is really important for some of the most thriving ecosystems. Um, and so how do we perform the future? Um, as that first question that Lisa named just felt so connected to um, like like spaces that imagine ourselves here and spaces that imagine ourselves in the future um that that doing so is a radical act and a reparative act that says that our bodies as they are in this moment deserve to be here and that we don't have to show up to be perfect or right or appropriate um for for the context of colonial capitalism There's some snaps in the room. Grant, do you want to talk about how you see that flourishing inside of your dramaturgical practice? Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I'll pull on this thread. Um, I am a part of a performance collaborative called the Curiosity Paradox with my partner, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Paradox Lee. Uh, we live together um, and our, our third sort of housemate is our garden named Lenore. And um, Lenore uh, has been featured in one of our, our first VR pieces and continues to be uh, called The Sweep. And the, the premise of The Sweep is that um, we used sort of our friend's alleyway that she uses for her garbage cans as uh, our performance space. And so we put a camera, uh, a VR 360 camera in her garbage alleyway um, and did a performance around it and then invited audience members to sit in the exact same location um, where the camera had been and put on the headset 
uh, while we continue to do a performance around them. And um, so there's this aspect of sort of folding time kind of backwards into what we had done in that space. And we said that this performance was for the neighborhood crows as well. So there's a little bit of like opening this piece for, um, for the non-human audience members in the space. Um, but with this, we also included audio description um, as like a as an as an aesthetic component that wasn't optional. So for those who aren't familiar, audio description is a way to give access to visual content for a given piece of art. Um, and so we were, we collaborated with an audio describer uh, whose name is Cheryl Green to uh, create um, an audio description for this. Um, so how this relates to this question of excess of futures where disability exists um, is that we we really endeavored to locate this performance in a space that was accessible um, to create these these visual content pieces that were also accessible for people who didn't have access to um, visual content and visual information. So there's there's a little bit of this like um, using some of the like the the tools that we know exist around access and just making sure that those are aesthetically integrated into the work that we're doing. Um, and in working with VR, there's also this element of kind of working into futures where our bodies are present, um, where our bodies are present both in this kind of digital life and also in the physical space that the audience is also inhabiting. Um, and so, uh, that to me just that, that that feels a little bit like that thread of how are we performing the future? Um, we're we're imagining very particularly our bodies in relationship with an audience member, um, and that that audience member does not necessarily look like um, the eugenically defined normative body. Rue, I know that you had some thoughts that you wanted to share just because we're communicating on another medium that no one else can see. <laughs> yes. Uh, hello, thanks, Grant, and uh, thanks to Lisa also for, for opening up this conversation. Um, I'm thinking, so I'm, I'm coming mostly from the, the practitioner side of theater, and so talking about dramaturgy is, is pretty new to me, and it's been um, really informative to be working with all these incredible um, thinkers and makers on unsettling dramaturgy. And so one thing that I think a lot about is in my past performances, um, I'm thinking specifically about my piece Histories, which is a retelling of Kitaba history um, and my own personal history. And then my other piece, which is called The Indigenous Core of Discovery, where I go into museums and um, talk about the invisibilized histories that are there. For example, the Smithsonian Presidential Portrait Gallery um, bringing to the forefront their policies against indigenous people um, that, that is hidden in the gallery. And, and the main audience for most of that work was not indigenous people. I've even said that um, when people have asked about it is that a lot of these stories that I'm telling are stories that a lot of indigenous people know. But as I've been doing this work and as I've been meeting with more indigenous dramaturgs and theater makers, I've been thinking a lot more about what indigenous dramaturgy would mean for us specifically and more generally. And I think that the very first thing that indigenous dramaturgy calls for is actually the proliferation of hundreds and thousands of uh, community specific dramaturgies. Um, I'm thinking more and more about what it means to be Kitaba specifically, not just an indigenous theater maker, but a Kitaba theater maker, and how I can re-center my own community as the audience for my work. How can I stop making work whose goal is um, simply to educate settlers and the settler society and instead make it about um, creating stories, recreating stories, um, being a good ancestor, giving people space to perform and to the audience and, and to see themselves in, in the work that's on stage. Um, I also am thinking about bringing Crip and also Indigenous dramaturgy, this question together is, is really amazing. And um, 
me and I talk a, a lot about this with some collaborators specifically about not collapsing indigenous dramaturgy and crypt dramaturgy together, but also making sure that we're not trying to put them into separate silos that are, you know, talking to each other from afar. Because many indigenous people do experience um, ableism and and anti-crypt uh, bigotry and, and vice versa. And so what, what does actual indigenous crypt dramaturgy look like? What would a Catawba crypt dramaturgy look like? And I think that this specificity for community also extends to specificity for land. Um, there's, a, there's a connection between museum spaces and theater spaces in that they both hope to make space without place. Um, that's where we get this idea of the white wall gallery or the, the black box theater is trying to create a space that any piece could fit inside of. But what does it mean when we start making pieces that are specific to the land? What what does it mean to make a specific a piece that's specific to the place um, that you all are in currently or to the place where I am currently? How can we bring in um, our human and other than human relations that are actually in the place that we're occupying to make a piece? Um, those are some of my thoughts that were coming up uh, with Big and Grant. Hello. Debbie, I'm wondering if you want to pick up the conversation here. Um, sure. I. What What strikes me most is is uh, Lisa's comment about the screen. And how, for me, crypt dramaturgy, which is the, the, the one I can speak to with some authority, um, is all about the body. And, and for theater, uh, for me, theater has always been about our bodies in space together and, and breathing the same air as each other and, and using the actual muscles of our body to vibrate the air that that vibrates the eardrums of the people in the room, you know, that, that there's that, like that actual physical connection is, is what theater is all about for me. And so within that, that paradigm, there's no place for the digital world in, in what I think of as theater um, or, or no place for this kind of, connection in what I think of it as, as theater. Um, and maybe I'm just a Luddite, I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's, that's, that's the thing I keep, I don't know, I keep butting my head up against how does, what is the role of, of, of the, the, the magic of, of this, this digital technology in, in the work I want to do. And I, 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 I just keep coming back to this embodied practice that is central for me. And uh, yeah. And I, I also recognize the role of, of digital connection for, for crip bodies that can't be occupying the same space at the same time. And I know that that's valuable But I, I can't help but feel like it's, 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 it's not, I don't know, it's not the work I want to be doing with my body in, in this world. Yeah. That's all I've got. <laughs> Jessica or Lindsay, I'm wondering if either of you have some thoughts either in response or new thoughts uh, to introduce into the conversation. Hi, this is Jessica. Um, yeah, it's an it is an interesting, uh, you know, way that those those conversations fit together. And I guess one thing that it makes me think of is that uh, something that I try to 
include within my practice is this idea of extending the edge. And I think that that is where, um, for me, digital uh, technology and media can play a role. So for example, on a show um, I worked on last year, uh, Cam Lupa, we, we um, created a podcast that lived alongside the um, production that uh, helped us to um, sort of talk through the process that we were um, going through as we went through it. And, and um, part of that hope was that we would be able to reach people who wouldn't be able to see the actual show, but still could be included as a part of what we were doing. So um, I, yeah, I think that that was an example of, of um, a way to extend that edge and certainly taking the time to, and being in relation to the space, the, the territory that we started on, uh, and the territories that we moved to are really important to grounding that show and, and taking the time to arrive and get to know each other. Um, but, but in addition to, we were able to extend that edge of, of what the performance was. Um, and, and I guess that also, for me, um, when I think about Indigenous dramaturgy, I think about seeking ways to indigenize practice. And, and primarily, I think that means uh, I, I, the, the how can unlearning become protocol question really resonated with me because I think that that is a lot of what I seek is, is how to unlearn or learn new tools or reimagine um, ways to uh, indigenize practice, to be able to find the internal dramaturgies that exist within a work and, and not about fitting it into the box of what we expect a work to be or to look like. So, you know, what is important to the artist? What is, what is integral to that piece that uh, maybe a colonial structure would say like, nope, get rid of that. That's not necessary. But like that could be the seed that, that it's like, no, this, this is here to honor something. And it's really important that it be a part of this work. Um, and I think, yeah, that just speaks to the idea of being able to bring your full self to the process um, and not being an empty vessel that that is to be filled up with something else. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, that resonates with me a lot, Jessica, um, the bringing your full self. Um, there's a couple of things for me that are like floating around that I'm not going to tie together because I don't think I can, but like this and this and this. Um, so uh, Lisa talked about like the like problems with linearity and that like for me as a mad maker and as a uh, crip artist is something that like I'm really trying to hold as um, a, as a, a practice that might make more space for like nonlinear thought and incoherence and um, that like questions about or, or challenges to what reality is and how we experience time as nonlinear is pretty central to like my mad engagements in the world and and then also the screen thing being really complicated. Um, I feel very deeply in relation to too, because I do think there's a lot of ways where there's few of us doing like deeply crip work um, and queer crip work, and which asks different things of the work that we make. And so the possibility of being engaged in this kind of conversation because we can actually get at each other across space and time is like so important to combating isolation that I think I experience, but I think a lot of um, makers on the margins um, I hear express as well. So there's like a way of combating isolation at the same time, like depending on where, where I'm at, like the idea of like 
a room full of people plus six people from different places and like the surveillance aspects of of media and like things being recorded and I don't know who's writing what and all of these things just like really amplify paranoia and and like how do we think about engaging in these kind of digital spaces in terms of performance but also in terms of making um, and connecting in ways that like also mean that there's certain things that are apparent, transparent, and things that are really like secret or, um, and and the ways that digital media and stuff is used for surveillance is like a big question for me. Um, Yeah, and then I think Jessica, what you just said about bringing more of yourself and the idea of like not having to be an empty vessel also really resonates for me and like what the value of Crip and Mad practices in the sense of like, it's precisely like bringing our shit into the room that is like the sites of generativity and possibility for creation that we often get told like leave your shit at the door and like that does not work for me nor does it enable the possibility of really building from our experiences and so I think there's something really beautiful about like refusing that Um, but then it also makes me think about like Um, some of the work I've been doing around trying to think what radical like anti-oppressive trauma-informed practices in in rehearsal spaces and processes and I think that that has a lot to do with like how dramaturgs hold space um, and how we understand like because of colonization and colonialism and because of ableism and sanism like we need to be attending to trauma in our our making and our rehearsal spaces and our performance spaces and our conversations. And then like, how do we do that in a way that's not pathologizing? Because most trauma-based literature makes people who are experiencing the trauma the problem. So how do we like radically anti-pathologize that those considerations and at the same time still recognize like trauma is in the room and we can do things together to make that like the space more receptive and responsive to those needs yeah so that's some of my questions i'm gonna share just a couple of thoughts and then we're gonna reorganize the space and you all will engage in your own conversations um so i'll just quickly close out a little bit And unfortunately, we only got to one of our 100 brilliant questions. Um, But I I hope that this has been generative so far. It certainly has been uh, for me. I think there's so much moving through me right now, um, so much resonance with what's been shared uh, by everybody else. And I I think one of the things that I want to talk about um, is the notion of alternative time signatures in the process of relationship and creation. And, um, you know, it's really interesting. We took the time to actually try to start to introduce ourselves to each other in the context of today. And that ate or occupied, um, I don't know, probably half an hour, 40 minutes of that time and and what is assigned value when we engage in convenings like this what is the dramaturgical value assigned to the work of establishing relationship and i think because we're working inside of colonial constructs of time that um don't honor i think the foundational work of establishing right relationship it makes it really hard to see that act that dramaturgical act of introducing ourselves as a primary priority but for me it's essential and so how do we adjust the timelines of our generative creative practice to really acknowledge the time that it takes to arrive to one another from the various locations barriers and distances that sit between us and so for me an, a, a crip approach to dramaturgy is always asking the question what sits between us And how do I get to you? How do we get to each other? In the same way that when I am working with an artist in the role of dramaturg, when I'm the dramaturg, you know, my my whole attention is tuned towards what's what's inside of this work that is longing for exposure, for expression. 
and and what is in the way of that exposure and expression and what are the conditions and sometimes those conditions are very practical it's like the studio is too cold for a body to relax in space in order for the nervous system to be able to function in such a way that we have access to the totality of creative energy that is coursing through us. So it's about asking the questions of all of the contexts that shape our, 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 our making. Um, and time holds such a centrality in that. What are we willing to make time for? And and for me, I am willing to make the time to know who I'm with, at least in this small, con unfortunately, you know, in an ideal context, we would have all introduced ourselves and, and not along a two minute timeline, but on a timeline that actually allowed us to sort our thoughts out, sort our bodies out and be able to present the thing that we wanted to present today. And that to me is a cripping of a dramaturgical way of encountering one another. Um, what else did I want to say? I really am, I work a lot on the internet in a creative, uh, in my creative practice. I'm working largely with people who are not geographically based where I am. And this question, this question, when Rue, you brought it up so beautifully when you talked about how museums are created to make uh, space without place. Is that what you said? Rue? Yeah, yeah. That's what I, right on. Okay. Um, and, and, and how do I, so how do we make place? How do we activate the various localities that we're in simultaneously when we're across such distances? And this is a conundrum that I'm really facing. Like, how do I bring place into my interface with the internet and the people who are on the other side of the screen with whom I am trying to fuse my, uh, my somatic... <laughs> body with in order to generate work how and how do I remain in my body when I'm relating to a medium that prioritizes my head which is to say my brain which is to say a really Cartesian approach to understandings of what where um, where thought comes from we actually have neural centers in our brains and in our chests and in our stomachs so like how do we attend to that in the context of working through this kind of medium. And, and I think one of the strategies has been about addressing time. Am I making time to actively breathe with my collaborators across space? To find a way to find a sensation that's in my body and to convey that. Um, to not prioritize verbal interaction in a medium that prioritizes that kind of interaction, the, the interaction of language. And I think these are all the kinds of dramaturgies that I'm trying to, I'd have, I'm, I haven't arrived to a practice that is working, but these are questions that I'm wrestling with. Um, and I don't feel like I'm saying actually anything different from what my brilliant collaborators have said. I just feel really lucky to go at the end because I got the benefit of all your good thinking. <laughs> um, so I think those are the thoughts that I would want to introduce into, into this conversation for now. Um, and if it, can we move it? Can we move to the next thing, you guys? Yeah? Should we move? Yeah? Okay. Right on. So um, if you're tuning in, have we set up a Google Doc? Did we do that? There's a... Great. And it's been shared on the Folda. Great. So if you're, if you're watching this live stream, you'll see a Google Doc that's overlaid over the live stream picture. And you can participate there. If you're in the room, here's what happens next. Um, people are going to get about 10 minutes time. <sighs> Can we bring the next card up, actually? Um, so here's an invitation for you. We're really about trying to activate practice through the context of this very short panel. Um, we invite you to conduct a conversation that responds in any way to the conversation you've just witnessed the six of us have. 
We invite you to experiment with taking a dramaturgical approach to this conversation that embodies some element of what you just witnessed, felt, learned. This is an invitation to crip or unsettle ways of exchange and being in relationship. 10 minutes is not a, a long time to do that work, but I wonder if even in 10 minutes an intervention can be made. And then you may want to take note of the key ideas, concepts, feelings, questions, curiosities, conundrums that come up in, oh, come up in during, <laughs> come up during your conversation, and you can feel free to document these in Slack. And the idea is that we'll have a bit of time for you all to work in smaller configurations, and then we'll come back together, and you all will have a conversation, and we will witness you. Yeah? Is that cool? So the people in the room say it's cool. I hope the people online think it's cool. And I think we think it's cool. Great. So let's come back at, um, let's say, 20 to 3. Yeah? 20, 20 to 3 Eastern Standard Time. Great. See you in a 12 minutes, 13 minutes. Oh, sorry, one other thing I wanted to say, if there are uh, CRIP or Indigenous identified folks in this room, please feel free to um, either not participate or to find your folks and participate with them in the context that feels right for you right now.
if you log on to the um, live stream, if you if you can, um, you'll see people are very engaged. They're very engaged. So we'll be, it's been a great conversation between the audience and us. Oh, okay. So we'll be witnessing <laughs> them. So if you want to keep directing the camera towards the audience, I think that's, okay, great. Okay, so I've just brought them back. <laughs> and um, we'll be passing the mic between various audience members. And I'm wondering if we got any engagement on the Google Doc. Cool. Um, so this is going to be just kind of an informal, organic, responsive moment for uh, the folks in the room to reflect on their conversations, things that came up for them. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to witness. Does that feel cool? Great. Great. So, so maybe we want to try to make a circle again of some sort. And so this is an opportunity for you all to engage with each other on questions, reflections that came up inside of your conversation. And you will need to use the microphone uh, in order to speak so that the people who are tuning into the live stream can um, also listen in. And um, I will give the microphone now to whomever feels the urge to say something. And if you have butterflies in your stomach, a mentor once taught me, it's your turn. <laughs> or not. Great. This is just access. I am slightly deaf, so I'd ask people to speak loudly and clearly. Hi, I'm Ange. I'm observing. And I know Debbie, Debbie has been my dramaturge. She's awesome. Uh, I'm working with Mia and Rue and Hugh, who's also in the room. They're all also awesome. And uh, yeah, I, I sat back to observe. That was uh, from because of me, not because of anyone else in the room. So thank you for having me in your circle now, and I'm excited to hear what uh, people have to say. And just to add, um, if you can please say your name before you speak. Uh, we haven't been practicing that perfectly, but now there's been a reminder from our crew that we would like that. So that would be great. Thank you. I'm going to begin, not because I want to begin, but to begin. My name is Adrian. Um, thank you, Angela. Uh, my I want to respond to the, uh, 
conversation that I just had with Cynthia, Jax, Charles, and Hugh. And uh, what I observed, which was hard to observe while I was conversing, um, I, observe <laughs> I observed my own critique uh, and that I, I was making a critique of uh, conference pro 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 pardon me, conference processes where there isn't time given to introduction and that I've observed that in practice before and how powerful it was to have a two hours where every person just introduces themselves. And so I was critiquing our own um, gathering here and I observe now, looking back, uh, that we just, w and we talked about how, why do, don't we do that? Because we just want to dive into the conversation. And But we ourselves just dove into the conversation. So despite a, an offer inside of our small circle, say, like, shall we introduce ourselves? And I myself even said, yes, I think that's a good idea. And then I myself said, I just want to. <laughs> 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 so that's, uh, like, that's how deep it is. You know, uh, the, uh, imp I don't know if it's impatience or what that, I don't know, that's the next stage of assessment or analysis, but uh, that's, a, I want to share that as a uh, 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 dynamic and action that I observed inside of our group. That is my final thought. This is Chantal, and um, just to uh, piggyback on what you just said, Adrian, we did exactly the same thing, except we didn't talk about introducing ourselves at the beginning. At the end, we just realized that we didn't do it. Like, we just jumped into the conversation, and then suddenly it's like, oh, hi, my name is. <laughs> so um, I think there was an excitement about starting to talk right away, um, and I maybe... I don't know. I don't know if like it was. I, I don't want to put a value judgment on it, but you know, we just followed that excitement, and then we kind of stepped back and introduced ourselves. I don't know how different it would have been if we had gone the other way around. But given the conversation that's been going on, it was it was funny to realize that. Hello, um, my name is Jasmine. Um, just a visual description again. I've got kind of just below shoulder length hair and I'm wearing a, a bright blue kind of <laughs> poncho. <laughs> um, but I think also in, in thinking about, we, we talked a little bit about conference set settings and um, how verbalizing is kind of prioritized and kind of visual learning through text and, and how that's so prevalent. Um, and I really loved looking over at your group and seeing you move and, and I, you know, just in that moment seeing you move, you know, um, thinking about, yeah, how, how our, our bodies are able to respond uh, to each other in this space. And so I loved that, you know, we didn't do our introductions, but I think we were kind of um, excited to meet each other through uh, our exchange and and that felt right and and um, I don't want to speak for anyone else but I I I loved um, just diving in in that way um, but I think I also want to acknowledge and name that in in the time that we have allotted for these kinds of conversations that there isn't often time for processing as a collective group and time for silence and, and what that can afford us as well. Um, that sometimes there's like a fear of silence or there's a certain like awkwardness. <laughs> um, but especially when we're diving really deep into these really complex, sophisticated things that, um, yeah, that there isn't always time for us to process.
Hello, I'm Jax. Um, something that came up for our team that I'm still sitting with is this question of why do we feel the urge to do so much? <laughs> like, and like here, Mia, you talked about only we only went through one question, and yet I'm sure the experience was effective in a way that we didn't experience in other panels. And so I'm still sitting with that question. Like, I don't know, why do we do so much? Like, there are hundreds of offices here doing hundreds of things. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. Uh, this is Hugh. Jax, I'd like to just follow that up with something that Adrian said that um, uh, has that is going to stick with me for a long time because it really resonated with me and and I'm sure it will resonate with people that I know. Uh, which, <laughs> which is that um, uh, when you're feeling overwhelmed and can't find a way through to the end of whatever your list may be is to write three things down that you have to get done that day and do one of them and do it successfully. Or at least that's the way I interpreted what you said. And that sticks with me because sometimes it's overwhelming to try and get everything done. and. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is Angela, and he was looking at me when he said that because I have a habit of putting myself quite literally into the hospital, uh, literally, <laughs> um, because I do too much. I, uh, uh, not to make this about me, but just a little history, I, uh, I worked in a very normative uh, way uh, had a, an injury, did not work for many years, and uh, it's because of conversations that are happening like this in the last couple of years, and leadership of people like Debbie, um, that I have been able to find my way back into practice. And that's amazing. And I do need to work on the time thing a lot because now when something, an opportunity comes my way, it doesn't matter if I have 800 other things on the go, I am going to say yes. Because I went for such a long period of time where there was nothing but no's. Whether those were self-imposed no's or no's that were coming at me. Um, and so I, anyway, long <laughs> way of saying, um, more of these conversations are going to teach us all how to work in a much healthier way. And I really do look forward to a time when I can say no <laughs> confidently, because I know that that's not going to be the last ask. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. Um, I'm really interested in this question of, like, is virtual space inherently space without place? Um, we do a lot of work in virtual space. <laughs> um, or like, could it be that it's multiplying place? What could it look like to bring place into that space? Um, I mean, in some ways, I think these are animating questions of something like the Fold Up Festival, but really just um, chewing on that um, and chewing on what it also, like, how to bridge the space, that beautiful um, thing that, I think, I can't remember who said it, but finding the space, be uh, to br bridging the space between uh, you and me, and how, what does that look like? What could that look like? What can it look like in, in a sort of virtual frame? Um.
as we were sitting here in silence and I was feeling varying degrees of discomfort slash like um, loving lingering in that, I was reminded of a pra- like a Quaker practice um, and I'm not Quaker, but I went to some Quaker schools of, of sitting in silence and only speaking when you're really called to or in their sort of spiritual terms when like the inner light speaks and how that's a really nice space to be in sometimes that I think also makes a different kind of room um, for speak up even though I'm in the mic. Do you need me to repeat anything? Okay, I'll just hold it closer to me. Yeah, you can't hear me despite the mic. Okay, (laughs) sorry. I'll repeat myself. As we were um, sitting in silence with what I felt like was varying degrees of discomfort and enjoyment, um, I was reminded of the Quaker practice of sitting in silence and really waiting until um, you're called to speak by the inner light or just like really needing (laughs) to say something. Um, And as we've been thinking about how to maybe unsettle or disrupt these practices of academia, of colonialism, of particular organizations of of time and space and privileging of text and um, over body and varying things, I, I actually think that many of the ways to disrupt that we already know as people who make performance who play for a living, who are in our bodies. Um, And yeah, and I wanted to thank the people I was in a circle with for witnessing me dancing and then all dancing together. And like it only took that long actually for me to feel like, oh no, we're we're all connected, so. I want to honor that we're at time. It's now 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which is when we said we would close. Um, I am happy to stay and continue having this conversation. I can't offer that um, on the part of my colleagues. Um, but if, if anyone has kind of a burning last comment that you'd like to invoke us out with, I. I welcome you to take the mic from me. Otherwise, I will close us out. Someone want to say something good? (laughs) Yeah. This is Jax again. Um, I just want to say that one of the biggest teachers for me here this time that I've been in this place um, has been the lake the body of water that we've been sitting in front of. (laughs) And um, every morning I've been looking at it and it just has so much to teach us, teach me. Um, And I encourage you all to remember that we are in a place and um, yeah. So I just wanna give gratitude to, to that body of water that's near us, thank you. So on behalf of Unsettling Dramaturgy, I want to thank everyone who is in the space with us and who's online for joining us for this first public launch of our our work in the world and um, offer immense gratitude for everyone's uh, good heart and good words and willingness to sit in discomfort and in um, curiosity and in ease together. And um, I hope that these conversations Uh, and these practices begin to infuse more and more how we come into engagement and relationship with each other through the work we're making. So thank you. Thank you all. Can you all stay online for a minute?